Okay, good morning. I was asked to give you a break from randomized trials and statistics and actually more to make a more institutional presentation, a kind of a novel view of um, UNICEF involvement in cholera at this point and where are we going. So as you have seen, we are quite involved in many of the research going on. Um, I was going to put a slide with partnerships and I realized that I can summarize in like a couple of words with pretty much everybody that's involved in cholera as a partnership with UNICEF. So we'll save you that one. As an overall view, not just for cholera, but for public health emergencies in general, uh, since a year ago in UNICEF, we are trying to review the way we work, bringing together all the different streams, whether it is wash and risk communication, and you'll hear about that in the next session, or uh, community-based health or child protection and uh, the activities they do, which also contribute to um, to outbreak response, and co including cholera. Uh, activities related to preparedness, how we're getting involved into IHR, uh, something UNICEF was not doing until now. Uh, and uh, of course, response and control, uh, long and medium term. So all that is now, we're trying to put all that together under the same umbrella within UNICEF and make sense out of it. So if you got to ask me, so a question that I get pretty often from, from donors and from partners is, uh, so what what's UNICEF doing that's not already done by WHO, who's the health organization? Why is this? Is UNICEF a WHO for children? And the answer is certainly no. The way we are positioned, and I think quite strongly, and the way we are um, kind of investing our capacities is s several levels, but the most important one is that all the big all the big investments of UNICEF in public health emergencies, including in cholera, are on the preventive side. So preparedness and preventive side. So where it is water and sanitation, where it is risk communication, um, where it is community-based health. So we are less invested on the on the curative side or the surveillance and epidemiology side, although we may be as well. And as you know, in Yemen, for example, we run directly uh, some of the um, cholera treatment centers and oral rehydration points. And uh, in some countries, we do as well. When there is a need, we get involved as well in, in, in community surveillance. So mostly on the preventive side, mostly on the control of the outbreak or the control on the long term. The other difference perhaps or added value that we think UNICEF has is a very large presence in 190 countries and uh, in those countries the presence of UNICEF tends to be quite at the district level as opposed to, to capital. So whenever you find a new outbreak of any disease basically there's a good chance that the closest team is definitely from UN is a UNICEF team unless it happens in a refugee camp and or that there is a partner of UNICEF working nearby. And very often when we get alerts from WHO saying do you have pe people on the, on the field nearby this, this, uh, this outbreak, it often happens that we do. And that's about my presentation. Now I have the slides as well, which I'm going to show you. But those I will, I, we will share so you can see in more detail. And I will concentrate only on a couple of things that I want to, to highlight. So uh, risk communication, there's a full hour after this on risk communication. So K10, who is our lead for, uh, who is in the room, he will prepare, he will present. Uh, but in terms of what's probably relevant for this group now, it's on the institutional presence down there and the ongoing discussion of how do we integrate risk communication into the GTFCC. It's a very important area for cholera control. It was part of the discussion in the last uh, in the last group. Who do get this behavioral change? That community engagement. The question has been asked: Should we have a working group on, on risk communication? I think the answer has been asked, has been answered negatively, but it still leaves the question of how do we integrate risk communication across all the different working groups, uh, because it's relevant for all of them, whether it's for vaccination, wash, for. Um, 
uh, detection of cases through surveillance and uh, clinical care, etc. The biggest part of the investment of UNICEF in cholera is definitely in WASH, as you as you know, and uh, we thank the with incredible support from CDC specifically, and on this area, and. Um, Here's again some of the things you've been exposed to some of UNICEF's work in WASH in the last 48 hours, including the investment case, which was done with, with a similar support, and the institutional presence, which include, up until now, the leading of this working group. Mm -hmm. Here's some of the major contributions. You're familiar with, with all of them, including some of them including research, advocacy, and the support that we provide directly to the countries where we work and to the country office of UNICEF so that our people in country are ready to represent and the, to be part of the conversation. Some upcoming projects, which I will, not, I will not delve on, but you will see them in the list, and if you, if you need, you will get more from team and from the other colleagues in the room. Some health activities, they mostly run around OCV, and the contributions to the GTFCC working group on OCV uh, case management, including the, the drafting of the guidelines and books. An uh, important part of UNICEF involvement, never to be forgotten, is the supply, supply division, where it is for the supply of the kits, the modeler kits, or the vaccine or wash supplies, and the role they play also in shaping markets and making sure that there is a capacity to scale up in case of risk in case there is a need of a response. It's kind of a fast overview. In the two minutes that I still have left, um, let me talk about other initiatives which are hosted by UNICEF in the same way that the Secretariat of the GTFCC is hosted by WHO. UNICEF hosted two major. One is the WASH cluster, and we got a representation here with, uh, with Dominique and uh, you all, the, all of this discussion we were having earlier this morning about the, how do we coordinate the humanitarian, specifically in the outbreak response in the humanitarian setting, and that's something that we're leading both as UNICEF and as the WASH cluster, together with the health cluster and WHO. And that's a discussion we hope to have in detail in the coming weeks and months, and perhaps by the time of the annual meeting in June, we can come back here and have that discussion feedback to you and to the other working groups what are we doing in those areas and all these coordination discussions that we are having and finalize the discussion by then. That's one of them. The other is the regional platforms. So the regional color platforms, and you will see, and I won't stop on them, but when you get a copy of the slides, you will see Monaro, which is Middle East and North Africa Regional Office. You're probably more familiar with EMRO, which is the WHO version of Monaro. Um, and the Cholera platform in West and Central Africa, which is based in Dakar. I will come back to this slide. And the one based in Nairobi from a regional office that covers Eastern and Southern Africa. So, um, seeing this, that the first one started in 2012 and started mostly as an information management hub in Dakar, but then it evolved to uh, uh, more of a hub for interaction and support of partners at the regional level to part to support the national level from the region. And I, I have the expert here, so I'm very afraid of not, not describing it correctly. Um, at this point, we've gone through some reflection in discussions with GTFCC. So one of the some of the decisions that are being made at this level is that, first of all, the, the regional platforms are not there to develop their own strategy or to provide a regional alternative to the global level. It's actually the regional extension of the global. So we first of all aligning these regional platforms to the roadmap. And that step is already done and you will receive it in the forms of uh, terms of reference which will, be, um, which will be shared soon and hopefully discussed. And one step beyond that, and that's related to the question I asked this morning about financing and advocacy, is they can play as well a major role in coordinating 
regional level advocacy, regional level funding, regional level support, exchanges between countries in the same region, sometimes in the same outbreak. Like examples we had, the one organ, the meeting organized, some of you were at the meeting in Amman in December, it was, sorry, in November. There was another one in, in Nairobi in December where countries from the same region came together under the auspices of the color regional color platform to discuss the challenges to learn from each other, to exchange and to strategize, always within the spirit of the GTFCC and aligned with the uh, with the roadmap 2030. And being harassed here, um, I will I will get you questions when when is the right time. And I will not answer them. I will actually ask my colleagues who actually represent all the things that I've been talking about so that they can ask directly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos.